Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to today's AI seminar. We have uh, Levi Lillis today, uh, who is an assistant professor at uh, University of Alberta, and he's also a professor on leave on uni at University of the Federal de Vicosa in Brazil. So he was a PhD student uh, in University of Alberta, and he finished in 2013 with Robert Holt and Sandra Zillis. And he currently is a CIFR AI chair and has many accolades to his name. So with this introduction, uh, I'll invite uh, Levi to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Aniraj. Uh, I was actually uh, trying to remember, I believe this is my AI seminar number seven. So I had uh, about three AI seminars during my PhD and then uh, three more after I finished. But this is the first time I'm presenting the seminar as a, as a faculty at the U of A. And uh, yeah, so um, I, I, let's get it started. So this, this uh, seminar is about actually two papers. So you can, you can see here at the bottom and the two, two papers, they were led by Lohan Orso. So uh, Orso is the, the, the first author in uh, both papers. And we're gonna be dealing with uh, tree search algorithms and planning problems. So uh, let's, uh, let me just give you an example of the kind of problem that we're, we're trying to solve here. So we call deterministic planning problems and a classic example is Sokoban, the one that we have on the right-hand side where we control the little man here and the little man is gonna push these boxes around. And the goal is to place the boxes on the, the goal position. So the goal position is given by uh, the little circles there. And uh, so for instance here, maybe the man has to push the box that way and then eventually it's gonna push this box here to this goal position. The man is gonna go around here and push the box to, to the goal position right there. And the way that we go about solving these problems is that we uh, plan ahead of time. So it's kind of like the agent thinks about the whole plan at once. And then once uh, the agent figures out the, the, the whole plan, then it's going to execute the actions in the environment. So the, the, the planning problem finishes when we find a complete plan to, to solve the problem. And we're going to see uh, search algorithms that use a policy, which is a probability distribution over actions uh, to guide the search and also a heuristic function uh, to guide the search. So we're gonna combine these two uh, in order to uh, more effect effectively guide the search to solve the planning problems. And uh, I'm also gonna tell you about guarantees that we have on the search effort for uh, solving uh, these kind of pl planning problems. All right, so uh, even if you haven't uh, taken any AI course, I, I hope you'll be able to follow most of the talk. I'll try to give as much background as I, as I can uh, to make you understand uh, these algorithms. So let's get it started with state space search problems. So maybe this is like the simplest uh, search space problem that I can use to describe. So it's a grid, and then we can imagine like we have an agent here that's gonna navigate on the grid. And the starting location of the agent is given by this uh, green square. And we need to plan a sequence of actions that's gonna take the agent to this uh, red square, which is our goal location. So in this case here, it's pretty simple. The agent has to move down one, two, three, four times. And uh, that's the, the, the solution to this problem. Like move down four times and uh, you get to solve uh, this problem. So we could use uh, very classic algorithms to solve this kind of problem. One of them would be Dijkstra's algorithm. So in Dijkstra's algorithm, we, we start here at our start location. And the numbers that you see on the grid, that's the cost of the paths that we, we've seen while trying to solve uh, this problem. But then again, it's the agent thinking ahead of time, and then it's gonna consider how different actions they're gonna play out. And once it finds a solution, that's when the agent is gonna uh, execute those actions in the, in the environment. So the value of zero here, it's because the agent haven't, uh, haven't tried any actions, but it could try, for instance, to move up, and uh, that's gonna incur this cost of one. So uh, the, the cost of moving up once uh, has the cost of one, or it could move a right, that's also gonna have the cost of one, or it could, for instance, move right <clears throat> and then right again, and that's gonna have a cost of two. And the way that Dijkstra's algorithm uh, works <clears throat> is by looking at these different possibilities for a given cost. So we're gonna look at all the possibilities with cost of one, and then once we analyze them, then we're gonna look at their neighbors, like for instance, they're gonna uh, be here, and then what happens if I go up? then I have this uh, state here with cost of two. So then I'm gonna look at all the states of cost of two. And then once I have verified all of them and I haven't found the solution yet, then I'm gonna look for all the states with cost of three. And then eventually I'm gonna look at the states with cost of four. And that's when I'm gonna find the solution. 
And the solution, of course, is just to find the straight path down. So I'm gonna uh, go down four times and then I find a solution to this problem. So this is what we call an uninformed search algorithm. And it is uninformed, as you can see here in this picture, like this, this gray uh, cells, is that it's looking everywhere in all possible directions. So you start here at the start location, and then you go around in circles like this, looking, uh, uh, give it the same uh, focus on all possible directions. And uh, for this problem, it, it feels like this is kind of silly because we know that the goal is down here, but we're still paying attention to the other directions. Like it could go to the left or it could go to the right, but I know that the goal is down there. So maybe I should try to focus my search uh, in this downward direction so that it, hopefully I can find the, the solution to this problem more quickly. And that's uh, exactly what we do with the A star search when we employ a heuristic function. So let's take a look at the a little bit of notation here of how this is gonna uh, work. So on the right-hand side uh, here, we have the, the state S. The state S could be our uh, starting location. So that's like the green cell that we have on, in our grid. And then as we apply a sequence of actions, then we might reach another cell in the grid, which is represented here by this, uh, this state N. And uh, in order to get to the state N, we have a cost and we often call that the, the G value. So that's uh, the, in our example is the number of actions that we applied in order to leave our starting location S and get to the state N. So that's, that's what we, we use for Dijkstra's algorithm. So the G value, it's all these numbers that we saw up here on the grid. Like for instance, the, the G value of this node, it's a two because we had to apply the action twice in order, in order to get to that state. And what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna estimate the cost to go. How far am I? Uh, from the goal. So that's that's what we call the heuristic function, which we're going to denote with h. So then we have this uh, distance to go, and then we have this dashed line here showing that we, we're not sure. This is an estimated distance to go. And what a star is going to use, it's actually the sum of these two quantities. So I have my f value, and I'm going to add up my g value and my h value, and uh, that's the estimated cost of a solution to my problem that's going through this node n. And uh, then the way that we're going to do the search is very similar to how I described Dijkstra above. But then instead of looking at the G values, I'm going to be using the F values. So the, this H that we're adding to G, it's going to allow us to focus our search towards the direction of the goal. So let's take a look at our running example here in case of uh, A star. So the numbers that we see now, uh, those are not the, the G values anymore. No, the, the, these are now the, the F values. Like for instance, for the, the starting location, what is the G value there? So the G value, we started, we haven't started moving yet. So we, we didn't pay any cost. So the G value is gonna be zero. But then now we have the H value. What is the H value for, for that state? So here we're gonna use a very simple heuristic. We're just gonna look for a straight line uh, to the goal and see uh, an estimated cost to go. So here we would have to make one, two, three, four hops. So the H value there is gonna be four. So if you add those up, then we have the F value being, being four for the starting location. And then we're gonna do exactly how we did for, uh, for Dijkstra's algorithm. We're gonna look at the neighborhood of this, uh, this starting location. So we can, for instance, we can move up, we can move left, we can move right, or we can move down. So then out of all these possibilities, we're gonna cross this off because we, we've seen that state already. So out of all these possibilities, I have four as the most promising one because it has the lowest F value. So that's the one that I'm going to analyze next. So then I jump to that one and I'm going to look at its neighborhood and then I have six, six to the side and then four. So then I'm going to analyze uh, the, the cheapest one. So I'm going to go like this, uh, always getting the cheapest one. And eventually I'm going to find uh, the solution to my problem, which is of course, just moving straight down. So what's happening here with the, the F value. So let's say that for instance, we take the F value for uh, this, this state here, right there. What is the G value there? The G value there is one because I was initially here and I had to make one hop and then I had to pay this cost of uh, one. And what is the, the H value for that state? Well, now I'm closer to the goal. So then it's one, two, three. So then the H value is gonna be three. If I add those up, then I have that the F value, oops, that's three. And then the F value is gonna be four. And that's different from moving backwards from the starting location because in the starting location here, I still have the G value of one because I move one up, 
but I just made my agent to be uh, further away from the goal. So now instead of making four hops, I have to make five hops uh, to get to the goal. So that's why the F value is a six. So the heuristic, it's helping us guide our search towards uh, the goal. So we're, we're trying to go to the uh, go to the goal as quickly as possible by using this uh, age function here that's helping us uh, guide our search. So if you look at the, the two pictures, then uh, for Dijkstra, we're moving like everywhere. But for uh, A star, we're diving into the uh, direction of the goal here, and we're focusing our search towards uh, the goal by using the, the age function. So this is what we we normally do when we want to guide the search and provide information to find solutions to planning problems more quickly. We derive a heuristic function, and then we guide the search that way. So what we're going to discuss today is something different, uh, which we're going to try to address some common problems that we have with, uh, with uh, using heuristic functions. So some of these common problems are related, for instance, to uh, we have no clue how long the search is going to take. Like we have a problem, we need to solve that problem, and we design a heuristic function, and then we start running the search so that we, we get to visit different states in the state space, but we have no clue how long it's going to take. Even if we know the solution path, we still don't know how long it's going to take. And uh, for instance, if we try to learn a heuristic function, then what should be our loss function in order to minimize the search effort? Like the, the heuristic function is gonna play a major role here in how much of the state space that we have to see in order to encounter a solution to this problem. So if we're trying to train a neural network to be our uh, H function in this problem, then what should be our loss function while we're training uh, this, uh, this heuristic function? And uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of, algorithms that instead of using a heuristic function, they use a policy to guide the search. And we actually have a, a very nice bound on the search effort as long as we know the solution path. And uh, this bound, it's also gonna allow us to have loss functions for training policies for guiding the search. We're gonna get to all the details uh, of how this is gonna play out. But the big picture is uh, we, we, wanna, we wanna use a way of guiding the search but instead of using this cost to go that we have here for the, the heuristic, we're gonna use a probability distribution over the actions that we have available uh, for the agent in each state uh, during our search. So let's take a look at a, maybe a very naive way of trying to apply uh, a policy. So this is uh, how we could use a, a policy guided search. So the numbers that you see here on the edges, they, they represent the policy. So this is, this is saying, we are at the starting location S, and then the policy is just unsure. It's putting 50% uh, probability moving to the left and 50% probability moving to the right. And, uh, and then whenever we get here, it's 1% probability, and here the policy is unsure as well. So one way that we could use this information, how can we use this probability distribution over the actions that we have available for each one of the states that we have in the in this tree in order to guide the search? Um, so one way that we could do this is simply look at the probabilities. Like for instance, uh, if I want to see the probability that I have for the node on the right-hand side, like uh, this one here, then I'm just going to multiply these two probabilities. So half times half, that's going to be 0 0.5. And uh, that's the probability of the node uh, that I have the arrow pointing to. And then if I want to see the probability of this node here, then it's half times 1, then the probability is uh, 0 0.5. And that's going to be the same for all nodes that are having this chain. So let's suppose that this chain is just, uh, it goes on forever. And all the nodes that, that I have in this chain, they'll have the probability of 0 0.5. And all the nodes that I have below this level on this binary tree that I have on the right-hand side, will have a lower probability. Uh, in this case here, for instance, is 0 0.25. So if you give a preference according to the probability of each of the nodes given by the policy, then I'm going to dive into this, this chain here, and I'm never going to come back. Because all the nodes that I have in this chain, they're going to have a higher probability than the nodes that I have on this uh, uh, tree here on the right-hand side. But then what if my goal, let's just draw a star here, and that's my goal. What if my goal is on the right-hand side? So I'm never going to find a solution to this problem. Because I'll dive into the, the chain here on the left-hand side. I'll never come back and analyze the subtree that I have on the right-hand side. And I'm totally going to miss this, uh, the, the goal here on the right-hand side. So the problem here is that basically we're trusting too much uh, the, the policy. We're saying every node that has a, a higher probability, I'm going to look at that node first before looking at other nodes uh, with lower probability.
So uh, we, we're going to solve this problem by using a different cost function. So instead of just looking at the probability, we're going to look at the probability and the depth of the node in the tree. Like for instance, the depth of this node is one, the depth of these two nodes is two, and so on. So then the cost function that we're going to use, it will be given by the depth of the node n divided by its probability pi. So then uh, we try to minimize this, this cost function. The lower the, the value of uh, this cost function, the better it is for us. And this is inspired in a, in a paper by Levy in the 70s. And uh, so essentially what's going on here is that let's say that uh, the probability is really low. Like if the probability of this node is really low, then uh, this value is really low and the whole cost would be high. And if we're trying to minimize, then we won't give a very high preference to this node in our, in our search. If the probability is very high, then the cost is going to be smaller, and then we're going to give a higher uh, preference to this node in the tree. But then we can see this depth in the, our equation acting as a regularizer for the policy. Take, for instance, this chain. If we dive into this chain, and then we get deeper and deeper, so eventually the d value of the nodes that we have in the chain, it's going to go up. And then the whole cost of the function is also going to go up. And then our search algorithm will stop paying attention to the nodes that are in this chain and are too deep. So the idea is that we're going to trust the policy for a little while, but eventually the D factor is going to, is going to play a major role and it's going to say, hey, you know what? They're going to stop investigating the subtree. You're going to backtrack and they're going to start looking at the nodes that I have on the binary tree on the right hand side. So by using this value of D, we're regularizing the policy. And that's going to allow us to see different parts of the space. And it's going to guarantee that eventually we're going to find a solution if uh, there is a solution for this problem. Like if there's a star in some point here in the tree, then eventually we're going to find uh, that star in the tree. OK, so that's uh, the cost function. And that's the intuition why it might be a good idea. But we can actually say uh, more things, more good things about this, this function. It might look like uh, a, a magical function right now but we can prove uh, interesting properties. But before uh, showing the interesting properties, let me show you an example of how we're gonna, we're gonna run this algorithm. So if you're familiar with A star, this is pretty much A star, but we're gonna replace the cost function F, and now we're gonna use the cost function D over pi uh, to sort the nodes in the open list. So this is still Sokoban. It's a slightly different notation here. The little man became a, a little robot, but we still have our boxes there and we have our goal location, and then we have to move the boxes uh, to the goal location. And then the different actions that we can take is uh, move the, the little guy here to the, to the left, where we could move down, or move up, or move right. So we can move to the four uh, cardinal directions here. And the numbers that we see, those are the, the, the probabilities given by the policy. So we're going to use that information uh, to, guide, uh, to guide our search. So we, we start just like A star. We're going to add to the, to the open list. The, the root of the tree, which is denoting our start state, uh, the problem that we, we need to solve. Then what is the Levin cost? We're going to call the Levin cost, d over pi, the Levin cost of a node. And then for the start state, is the, the depth is 1, and the probability is 1 of being there. So it's uh, 1 divided by 1. That's not very hard. So that's going to give us the, the cost of 1. So we insert on the open list little a with the cost of 1. And then in every iteration of the algorithm, this is what we call a best first search algorithm. We're going to go to the open list. We're going to pop out of the open list the node with the smallest labbing cost. In the first iteration, this is easy. Uh, we only have one node there. So we're going to pop it off, and we're going to put in the closed list. And once we do this, we're going to look at its children. So it's uh, basically looking at all the actions that we're going to apply at A, and then see all the states that we can reach uh, at a, from, from A. And uh, here we have a bunch of options, like we have B, C, D, and E. And here, uh, uh, I'm just simplifying this problem. Like, uh, you're going to see this dashed arrows here. I'm just going to ignore all those actions so that the, the example is going to be uh, smaller and easier for us to track. But then we're going to put in the open list all these nodes, the children of A. And then uh, let's get it started with B. So we're going to add B here. And B is going to have its levying cost. And what is the levying cost of B? Well, uh, we're going to look at its uh, depth and its uh, probability. So the depth is 2. And we're going to divide it by its probability, which is 0 0.1. So that will give us the lagging cost of 20. So B uh, gets inserted to open with 20. And that's the same for, for C. It has the lagging cost of 20. 
And then uh, we got D. So D, it's a, a little bit cheaper, has the leveling cost of 10. And then finally E, then the math here is starting to, to become hard for me to, uh, so, but I didn't have the time. So E should be uh, 3.33. I didn't do the math wrong uh, ahead of time. So then uh, it's it's like we're, we have this frontier, right? We're moving the search frontier and we're currently sitting here. We already saw A, it's sitting in the closed list so we know that we don't have to visit it again. But then we have the search frontier and now we got to decide uh, which way that we're going to go next. And so the, we make this decision based on the living cost. And the living cost of E is the cheapest one. So that's the one that we're going to expand next. We pop it out of the open list. We move it to the to the closed list, and then we look at the uh, E's uh, children. So again, here I'm going to ignore some of the children. I'm just going to look at this child here, which is G. And then we need to compute the the living cost of G. What is the living cost of G? So the depth there uh, is uh, three, but the probability is given by 0 0.6. I'm just going to multiply the probability that I have along that path times uh, 0 0.4. I also did this ahead of time. This should be uh, 12.5. So then uh, here we have the cost of 12.5 and that's a living cost of the node G. So here, maybe you can pause for a second and take a look at what's going on. Like uh, we can look at the probability distribution and we see that the probability that the policy assigned to B and C, it's rather low. And that's gonna reflect in the living cost of those two nodes. So that's why we, we give a higher preference to E because it has a higher probability. So we're going to investigate the subtree here uh, more than we're going to investigate the subtree on the on the left hand side because uh, we have a higher probability there. But then now we got to see G, and uh, G has a slightly uh, higher leveling cost, twelve point half, compared to to D. So now we're going to actually go back and we're going to investigate D. So you can see that the policy here it's acting kind of like the heuristic function for for A star, and it's telling us where where we should go uh, with with our search. So then the next node that we're going to do here, it's uh, D. So we're going to pop D out of the open list. We're going to move it to the closed list. And then we get to see its children. And um, I'm going to ignore a bunch of them just to make it simpler. But we get to see F. And what is the living cost of F? Well, it's, it's depth uh, 3 divided by its probability, which is uh, 0 0.2 times 0 0.7. And I also did this ahead of time. And it's uh, 21.42. All right. So we continue here and the next one to be uh, expanded and to be analyzed by the search algorithm is G. And as soon as we do G, then we get to see the solution. Uh, I forgot to mention, but these, these green nodes here that represent the solution, you can actually see the boxes, they're sitting at their, their goal location. So as soon as we expand G, we get to see a solution and the solution is given by this path that we have in the tree. So uh, then we're done, we have solved the problem and we know exactly which actions that we should take in order to to solve this problem. And um, I, I might be able to argue here that the policy actually helped us because it allowed us to focus our search in these two branches here that look more promising according to the policy than these other two branches here that uh, had a, a lower a lower probability. So that's uh, Levin tree search, uh, the algorithm that's a uh, best for search algorithm that uses D over pi as its um, uh, cost function. And that's how we, we go about solving problems with Levin tree search. Right, so that's uh, the search algorithm. Any questions about this, folks? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, it doesn't look to me in this example like you're guaranteed to find the shortest path. Are you? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the guarantees we don't have with Levin Tree Search is to find optimal solutions. So you can always design this adversarial case where uh, you're going to fail to find uh, the optimal solution. So you can see this as a satisfying uh, kind of search algorithm. It's gonna find a solution if, if there is one, but you have no guarantees with respect to how close to optimal it is. Hey Levy, um, so you also need to put some kind of lower bound on the probabilities, don't you? Because otherwise you can kill some branches completely. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. When we're learning these probabilities, uh, we we tend to learn probabilities that won't be driven to zero, but if they're driven to zero, then you might have an issue. Uh, another trick you could do is to mix probabilities. Like you could have always a uniform policy and you could mix that policy with whichever policy you learned uh, in order to avoid the zero probabilities. 
Um, I have a, a few results that we could discuss related to this, but maybe we should take it offline. Like uh, there are some interesting observations related to this on how you learn the policy and how you need to use this kind of band-aid kind of solution for mixing the uniform probability with the probabilities that you learn. Uh, I have a few questions here in the, in the chat too. So uh, Charf is asking if uh, A is depth is one, that's correct. So the depth here is gonna be one for our node A. Uh, then Ken is, at, is actually answering the question for me, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Ken. And then the other question is a process mining algorithm. I don't know what a process mining algorithm is. So maybe, maybe you can tell me offline and then we can discuss and tell you if this is a process mining algorithm. Okay, folks. So uh, this is the search algorithm and uh, we, we can actually show something interesting about the, the solution that we just found. Uh, so here's our solution. And once we find the solution, we can actually derive a bound on the search effort. And um, I'll first show you the bound, and then I'll tell you why this is uh, this can be interesting. So here's here's our uh, solution path that we start at the uh, at the root of the tree and we go all the way to uh, to the solution. The Levin cost that we have for our solution is a uh, is an upper bound on the uh, size of the tree that we had to expand in order to find that solution. So if we get the depth, and the depth is four and we divide by the, the probability of reaching that node, that's gonna give us roughly 19. And 19 is an upper bound on the number of nodes that we have to expand in order to, to find the solution. So why is this interesting? It's something that we find once we're done with the, with the search. So maybe it's uh, useless in the sense that you already know how many nodes you had to expand. But the, the interesting thing about this is that we can use this as a loss function to learn the policy. And uh, it's cool because we're only looking at the single path we have no idea what's going on here on the left-hand side of this tree. We're only looking at that path and we can still get a, a pretty good estimate of the size of the search tree. And with that in mind, we can use this as a proxy function to uh, train a policy in order to guide our search. So this is exactly what we're gonna do in our experiments. We're gonna use this uh, upper bound as a, as a loss function to train a policy to guide the search. So uh, we're actually going to dive into this. I, I'm going to show you a sketch of the proof uh, of how we, we got this bound so you can gain an intuition of uh, what's going on here. So let's say that the, the solution node that we encounter is uh, n star. So we're running our search. Eventually, we find a solution, and our solution is n star. So uh, the landing cost for n star, let me just zoom in here so I have a little bit of more space. So the landing cost for uh, n star, it's, uh, it's depth of n star divided by pi of n star. So that's uh, the Levin cost. And we're just gonna call it B. So that's the, the Levin cost of the solution node that we found while running uh, Levin tree search. And what we wanna do here is that we wanna bound the size of the tree. So size uh, of tree, and uh, we wanna bound it. We're gonna find a, an upper bound for the size of the tree that we had to expand in order to find a solution. So uh, one bound that we can get here is by looking at the leaves that we have of the tree. So let me just draw a small example here. So let's say that this is our, our tree that we expanded while finding the solution with Levin tree search. We can look at the leaves that we have for this tree, like the leaves are right here. And then uh, if I add up the depth of all the leaves that I have, then I naturally get uh, an upper bound. So for instance, the, the depth of the leftmost node here, it's a three, then the other one is three and three. So if we add up, that's gonna give us nine and that surely is a, uh, an upper bound for uh, the size of the tree. So that's exactly how we're gonna uh, move forward here. I'm gonna add up all the nodes and I'm gonna denote my a set of leaf nodes as capital L. So for all my leaf nodes, I'm gonna just add up the depth of uh, all those nodes. So that's how uh, we're going to start the, uh, our uh, sketch of a proof here. All right. So uh, the other fact that we're going to use comes from the property of the algorithm. That's a best first search algorithm. I'm not going to show you the proof, but we can prove that once we find a solution, our n star, all nodes that we expanded during search has a Levin cost that's lower than B, which is the Levin cost for the solution node. So let me, let me write that down. 
So for, for all nodes, uh, and that's also gonna include uh, the leaf nodes that, that, that we're dealing with here. So for all leaves, for all n in my uh, set of leaf nodes, I'll have the following property. I know that their d of n over pi of n is less or equal to uh, the value of b, which is the, the living cost of the solution node. So then I can, I can rewrite this. So I know that my d of n is less or equal to uh, pi of n times, uh, times b. And then once I get this inequality, I can go back and replace this uh, value here, the right-hand side of the inequality with this value right there uh, of d. And then I'm gonna get the following. Just, uh, I'm just gonna write a size. So I wanna buy, uh, bound the size of the tree and that's less or equal to the sum of all leaf nodes of their probabilities times uh, the lighting cost. Okay, so here's another property that we need to use in this, in this proof. As long as we're using a valid probability distribution, like for every node in the tree, then we look at the possible children, and then uh, those are gonna give me a valid probability distribution adding up to one, then I can say the following. I'm not gonna show you the proof, but uh, we, we can actually show this. This is often called a trunk of the tree. Like if we make a cut, in, this is the tree that we expanded, like this triangle is representing the tree. So if I make a cut in this tree like this, uh, we cut a trunk that way. So we have many nodes here along this, uh, from side to side of the tree. Then if I get all the nodes that I made this cut across, like all nodes n, and if I add up their probabilities, this has to add up to one. So that's a property that we have from uh, uh, Levin Tree Search. And that's gonna be true for any cut that we make in this tree, including the leaf nodes. So if these are like the leaf nodes that I have, and if I make that cut in the, the leaf nodes, then uh, that's also gonna add up to one. So that means that this whole thing here, it's one. And then, uh, then I have the equality that's uh, B. So that's showing that the size of the tree, it's gonna be bounded by the living cost of the uh, solution node. So I know that I have this upper bound, and now I can use this upper bound, for instance, for, for training uh, the policy. Any questions about this, uh, folks? Hey, yeah, I've got a question, Levy. You've got there for all n in the set of leaves, d of n over pi of n, less than or equal to b. But I thought you were choosing things with the smallest leaven cost first. So I thought that n star would have a smaller leaven cost uh, than all of the guys who were left in the open list and not a larger one. Oh, okay. That, that's a good point, Rob. So the, the guys who are left in the open list, they, they will indeed have a, a higher levin cost. But what I mean by leaf here, this, this set L, it's uh, the set of leaves that I have in the tree. Like you can imagine like the, the brute force tree and then Levin G search is going to expand a subtree of that tree. And once you cut that subtree, you're going to have leaves in that subtree. I'm talking about those leaves. So the, those leaves, they're out of the open list already. They were expanded uh, before uh, th that value. Not sure if that makes sense. Uh, no, but I'll drop it. We can talk afterwards. Okay, okay, sounds good, sounds good. I also yeah, have a it, question. It's, Sorry if it's always the same people. Um, that's okay. When you say the, when you have the cut, the sum of the probabilities is one. So I wondered if you have some short branches that actually end before the cut because it's like a dead end or something. Wouldn't that break that sum being one? No, it doesn't because uh, then the probability is gonna die there and uh, then the probability get, gets redistributed to other branches in the tree. So um, I would have to show you the proof to, to, uh, to, to show you that this is indeed the case. But if you have uh, branches that die on the way, then uh, th th this should work still. Okay. Uh, and uh, Rob, going back to your question, uh, it's, it's really based on the definition that we have for the leaf nodes. It's a, a small difference between the nodes that are expanded and generated. So it's a, it's a fuzzy definition the way that I made here with the, with the leaf nodes, but I absolutely see what you mean. Because uh, whenever I call it leaf nodes and uh, they were expanded, so you, you wouldn't call them leaf nodes anymore, right? So yeah, it's, it's really it based on the definition. Like that. That's why I thought we could talk yeah. afterwards. Yeah, cool. 
All right. So it's it's dependent on the way that we define the, the, the leaf nodes. So this is a, a sketch of the proof. Uh, if you want to see the details, that would be in the 2018 uh, paper. So let me just show you a few examples and uh, so that you perhaps you can get more intuition of what's going on. So if our tree looks like the, the tree on the left hand side, then the actual size here, it's uh, it's not hard to, to see. It should be D. Like you have the depth and uh, that's the number of nodes that you have uh, uh, in this tree. It's just a chain of, of nodes. And what would be the, the leaving bound in this case? So the bound that would be uh, the depth divided by, by pi of uh, our uh, solution node would be the, the last one in this chain. And uh, pi here, of course, uh, that's going to be 1. And then we end up with uh, d of n. So this is the case where things are just going to work out nicely, uh, where the actual value is going to match the bound. And whenever we start sharing paths on the trajectories like this one, then we won't get an exact value. It's uh, only going to be an approximation. But let's take a look at how bad this approximation can be. So what is the actual size of this tree? So the actual size of this tree, it's uh, if we have a depth uh, d, then it's going to be 2 times uh, d to the d. And that's the actual size of the tree. And what is the, the laving uh, bound telling us? So it's a uniform policy here so that the, the distribution is half everywhere. And um, so we're going to get the following. So bound. So the bound will be uh, uh, d over pi. Uh, what is d? Uh, it's uh, d of n. And then pi will be uh, 2 to minus uh, d of n, which will give us uh, d of n times uh, 2 to d of n. So it's, it's not exactly the same as the size of the tree. Like it differs here, here we have a two and here we have a D. So the deeper the tree, the, the larger the, the difference will be. But uh, the, the exponential term of the, the, the equation, we get it right. So it's a, it's a reasonable approximation. Uh, we actually have a better way of deriving this bound so that we can account for the paths that are sharing like uh, a prefix here, uh, but that's, that's unpublished but uh, we can actually get something that's slightly better than what we can only have here. So this is just to give you a little bit of intuition uh, of what's going on with, with this bound. Okay, um, so this is lab tree search, uh, very straightforward. We have D over pi, and then um, we sort the nodes in the open list according to D over pi. But we can, we can actually uh, do better. But before we, we do better, let's just take a, a step back and uh, look what we have so far. So we start discussing A star, and in A star, we use this uh, cost function f. So we have the cost that we traverse so far and the cost to go. And uh, that gives us the, the f value. And what we're doing with Laving Tree Search, so here's Laving Tree Search uh, in the middle. So we're actually using an estimated search effort for the node that we just saw in order to decide whether we're going to keep expanding that node. So this d over pi fraction is estimating the size of the tree that we had to expand in order to see node n. And we use that to decide whether we keep searching from n uh, onwards. So uh, we're really missing here what's going on after n. So what is the cost to go? Like we do with A star. If with A star, we use g, but we're also trying to estimate the cost to go. And for Levin G search, we're estimating the, the cost that we traversed already, the cost that we already paid, but we're missing the cost to go. So what is the size of this tree that we're trying, uh, that we still have to expand in order to solve this problem? So this is essentially what we're going to do here on the algorithm on the, on the left-hand side that we're going to derive next. So we have this tree, and we don't know what is the cost of this tree, so we need to derive this, this equation here. So how do we estimate the cost to go so that eventually we're going to find our n star, the solution to our problem? So it's actually going to be easy. Uh, what we call it the policy guided heuristic search, and uh, we we have an estimated cost to go. We can use the heuristic function, and this is exactly what we're going to do. So the the size of this subtree here is going to be estimated as the number of steps that we have to perform in order to get to n star, divided by the probability of n. So then we have h of n divided by pi of n. And that's going to be our uh, first uh, try here in estimated this, this cost to go. And similarly to, uh, to A star, we're going to add them up so that we have a total estimate of the cost of the search of a solution that goes through this node n. 
So then we have uh, D of n plus H of n divided by pi of n. And that's, that's the algorithm that we call uh, PHS. So we're using both a policy and a heuristic. So we're trying to estimate the total effort of uh, the search uh, that we have to perform in order to find a solution that's going to go through uh, this node n. We also have uh, interesting properties about this. So I'm not going to derive uh, this, this bound, but I want to give a little bit of intuition of what's going on here. So as soon as we start using a heuristic, then uh, now we have to account for how accurate the heuristic is. This is what this uh, factor here uh, is telling us. Uh, I won't show you exactly what it means, but it's based on the heuristic. And you can probably see here already on the left-hand side, this is our Levin bound. So the, the Levin bound doesn't change. So that's uh, still playing a role there on the number of nodes that we need to expand to find a solution using PHS. And then the, the term that we have in the middle, it's, it's a bad term. This is uh, whenever the heuristic is, is, is inaccurate, then the heuristic could lead us to parts of the space that's just gonna take us longer to find a solution. So this is a number that could be greater than one. Could also be one, but could be greater than one. And uh, the term that we have on the right hand side, that's a good term. And that's a term that could be less than one. So if the heuristic is good, is guiding us towards the goal, then uh, this is telling us, hey, uh, you have to expand fewer nodes. If the heuristic is not good, then it, this is gonna be greater than one and it's gonna increase the bound. But then here's something cool about this. Uh, we, we have a property that's called PHS admissible. And if we show that the heuristic is PHS admissible, this is just gonna go away. The bad term would disappear because uh, the whole thing in here is gonna be one. And then we have the only the term that's helping us. So if we can show that the, the heuristic has this property of being PHS admissible, uh, then it's only going to help. So it's never going to hurt. It's always going to help. And But uh, what is PHS admissible? I won't get into the details, but here's something cool. If you can show that the heuristic is A star admissible, like in the A star sense, then that implies the heuristic being PHS admissible. So as long as you're using a heuristic that's admissible from the A star perspective, then this middle term here is going to disappear and the heuristic is always going to help you. It's not never going to be worse. It can only be better or the same uh, when you employ a heuristic that way. So if you compare it to Levin G search, this, this PHS uh, search algorithm can only be better. So if you want to see the details about this, this is in the uh, 2021 paper uh, at AAAI. All right. But uh, you might be wondering already, uh, we, we need a different version here. We, we can actually do better than this, better than, than PHS. And that's because of the following. When, when I mentioned that we're trying to estimate the size of this search tree, we decided to use H, which makes perfect sense, which is the number of hops that we have to perform in order to, to, got to, the, to get to the solution here at the bottom. But then we're still using pi of n. But pi of n is the probability of n, is not the probability of n star. And very, very often in practice, we're going to have the following. So if you look at this, this one value here, and we analyze with respect to pi of n star, so pi of n star tends to be very, very small and uh, much, much smaller than pi of n. And that makes sense, because uh, if we're still a long distance to go from n to n star, then we're always multiplying by a value that's less than 1. So then uh, pi of n star is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. So then our estimated search effort here would just be a very inaccurate one. So we, we would like to do better. And we're going to do better by having a better estimate of the probability pi of n star. So what is the probability of reaching this node n star? So how can we do this? So we're going to do the following. We're going to look at the average probability that we have along this path. And we're going to assume that all the probabilities that we, we see along the path here at the bottom we have the same average. So that's going to allow us to have a better estimate of the what, what I call the probability to go. So what is the probability that we still have to pay in order to get to the bottom of this tree? So, and how can we, how can we uh, compute this average? So we can look actually at the probability of our node n, and then uh, we're just going to compute the average. So we know how many hops that we have to perform from the root of the tree all the way to n. So then the average can be computed that way. So this is the average of the probability 
uh, of all the hops that we have along this path. So this is, uh, let me write this here, this is the average probability. And then once we have the average probability, then I just can assume that the, the, all the probabilities that I'm gonna see in this uh, tree here at the bottom, they're gonna have the same average. And that will give me a better estimate of the uh, pi of n star. So I can approximate pi of n star just by getting my average probability, pi of n to one divided by d of n. And then this whole thing here, uh, it's gonna be to the power of a d of n plus h of n. So this is, uh, it should, shouldn't be an inequality. So this is an approximation. So we're approximating the value of pi of n with this uh, average probability that we have. And once we have this, then now we have a new cost function. And what is the cost function? Is our estimated depth for the solution, d of n plus h of n divided by our estimated value for pi of n star. So just gonna simplify that. So then we have pi of n to the power of one plus uh, h of n divided by uh, d of n. So that's our new cost function. And this is what we call PHS star. We call it PHS star because uh, it's kind of like A star, right? Uh, you're trying to estimate how much you have to go. And in this case, we're estimating uh, really the, the size of the tree by having a better uh, estimated probability that we still have to go. So this is the cost function. And again, I can just go back to uh, labbing tree search and the cost function that we're gonna use in order to expand the nodes, uh, it's based on this, uh, on this cost function. So this is a PHS star. So these are all the algorithms I wanted to show you. Uh, uh, so we have uh, Levin tree search, we have PHS and PHS star are the, the, the last two. There are the two algorithms that use both a policy and the heuristic function. Any questions folks uh, uh, up to now? Uh, as usual, I've got one here. Uh, you said that any algorithm, any heuristic that was A star admissible was also PHS admissible. Uh, do you have examples of things that are PHS admissible but are not A star admissible? And do you think there's room for the notion of A star admissibility to be uh, to be extended? That's a good question, Rob. I don't have any examples from uh, from the top of my head. I would have to put the two equations side by side and then try to make up a very small, a small example showing uh, PHS admissibility, but not uh, A star admissibility. But that, that's, a, that, that's a good exercise for me later. Oh, I see, I have questions here in the, in the chat as well. So Nathan is asking about consistency. So the, yeah, that was in terms of PHS start or PHS, you said it could use any um, admissible algorithm, admissible heuristic, but what about an inconsistent one? Yeah, it should be fine. As long as it's admissible, you should be okay. Do you, do you still need to re-expand nodes like you would in A star? Yeah, so here uh, we don't worry too much about uh, re-expansions because uh, we're not dealing with bounds on the solution quality or uh, we, we have no guarantees of the solution quality. So we simply ignore the, the re-expansions. Okay. And it, it still, the, the bounds should still work uh, uh, nicely, yeah. Uh, I still have a few questions in the chat, uh, but there's one algorithm that I wanted to explain and then maybe just show uh, one empirical uh, result. And, and then I can, I can move on to the questions because I only have nine minutes. So let me try to just explain this, this one algorithm here uh, that we use for learning the, the policies and the heuristics in, in our experiments. So this is the bootstrap system. So this is a, a paper by uh, Shahab, uh, Zandra, and Rob back in 2010. It's been uh, 11 years already. So it's a very elegant paper and uh, algorithm that uh, I've been using quite often to learn policies and heuristics. So let me just give you uh, a general idea of how the, how the algorithm works. So we have uh, the search algorithm and we wanna learn, let's say a policy and a heuristic for that search algorithm. So here's our search, let's just call it PHS star. Let's do for PHS star. And then I have a set of tasks. Like I have all the tasks here and uh, my training tasks. And I also have a budget. So this budget here, it's how many nodes I can expand while you're trying to solve one of these tasks with my current policy and heuristic function, which in this case is encoded by a neural network. So initially I just randomly initialize the weights of the neural network and uh, my search algorithm is gonna interact with the neural network. 
and uh, uh, query the policy and the, and the heuristic values while using at most X uh, nodes to be expanded while trying to solve these, these instances. So then I'm going to go instance by instance. Like, let's say I pick this one. I give it to the search algorithm. The search algorithm is going to try to solve it with that budget and the randomly initialized uh, neural network. If we're lucky, then uh, it's going to solve that instance, and then it becomes training data. So then uh, we move on to the next one. And maybe this one is a little bit harder. So we can solve it. It, go back, it goes back to the set of uh, training tasks. And then we go through each one of them. So a bunch of them, they're going to be solved because they're very easy. And others, uh, we try to solve them, and we, we can't solve. Once we finish going through all those instances on the left-hand side, then now we have new instances uh, training data on, on the right-hand side. So now we can pick up all these training instances, and we can give it to the neural network, and we can adjust the weights of the neural network so that now we have a better policy and a better heuristic function based on the training data. So then now we go back to our, our set of training tasks, and we try to solve them again. But now we have a better policy and a better heuristic, so hopefully we're able to solve them. But sometimes we're unlucky, and uh, maybe we try them all, and we're unable to solve any of the instances, despite the fact that we have a better policy and a better heuristic function. So then what we do is we uh, double the budget. So budget was x, now we do 2x, so that we can uh, uh, try harder to solve those instances. And then eventually what will happen, we keep doing this procedure, Eventually, we're going to just move all these training instances here to the right-hand side, and then uh, they become training data. Once they become training data, I can give all of them to the neural network. I just wait to the neural network based on the training data, and hopefully, by the time we finish, we very, have a very strong policy and heuristic function uh, to guide our search. So that's a bootstrap system that we use in our, in our experiments. Uh, any questions about the bootstrap system? So Rob is here, he could answer the questions for me. Okay, maybe no questions about the bootstrap. Okay, let's move on to the empirical setting. We tried uh, different algorithms. Uh, so we tried, for instance, a PUCT. It's a, it's a major baseline here because it's also a search algorithm that uses both a policy and a heuristic function. Uh, it's, it was famously used in uh, alpha zero and now we're using here in, in the single agent setting. Uh, we try Levin G search that only uses a policy, PHS and PHS star that using a policy and a heuristic function. Weighted A star and really best for search, those are two algorithms that do use a uh, heuristic function only. We also tried A star. I should have written A star here as well. And uh, we try this on Sokoban, uh, a puzzle from the game The Witness, and the 5x5 five five sliding tile puzzle. So the learning scheme, we use a neural network for all the algorithms. Whenever we're learning a policy and a heuristic, we uh, have two heads in our neural network. And for all uh, domains, all three domains, we have 50,000 training instances. And the training was capped by seven days uh, of computation, no GPUs. Uh, if we had GPUs, we're, we could probably do this faster, but only use CPUs. And for the loss function, when you're learning a policy for Levin tree search, PHS, PHS star, we actually use the bound. So we use the Levin bound to, uh, to train the neural network. So whenever we adjust the weights of the neural network, we're trying to minimize the search effort. And uh, I, I find this really cool because it's a good proxy of how many nodes you have to expand. And then you try to minimize the number of nodes you have to expand while training uh, your policy. For PUCT, we use cross entropy, which is uh, the, the loss function that people normally use. And for A star, greedy best first search, weighted A star, we use uh, mean squared error. OK, let me show you the, the training results. And then I can go back to the questions. Uh, so in, the, in this plot, we, we want to get to the bottom as quickly as possible, because the y axis is the number of unsolved problems. So the more problems you solve, uh, the, the quicker you go to the bottom. And then on the x-axis, we have uh, running time in seconds. And this is for Sokoban, this very first plot. And then we can see here uh, P, it's for PHS star. It gets uh, very quickly here to the bottom. Uh, weighted A star, it's actually doing all right here as well. So weighted A star, it's, uh, it's an algorithm we know that works well for, uh, for this problem. Other folks have used a weighted A star for Sokoban, and uh, it works quite well. Levin tree search, it takes a little while, but eventually it catches up and it learns a, a good policy here at the end. Uh, so that's, that's Sokoban. Maybe more interesting than Sokoban, it's uh, this lining tile puzzle. So th this is somewhat surprising. Uh, some folks in the, in the audience, they might find this uh, fairly surprising. 
so when they start the big champion here, uh, it very quickly solves all the instances. And uh, that's the algorithm that everybody uses to solve this, uh, this problem. Like weighted IDA star, weighted A star, uh, they all work about the same. And uh, it works very well uh, for, for this problem domain. PHS star eventually catches up and also solves all the, all the problems. So it learns a very good policy and a good heuristic function. But all the other algorithms, they struggle so much uh, to learn anything helpful uh, for uh, this sliding tile puzzle. So uh, uh, I conjecture that the issue here is that it's uh, easier to learn a heuristic function, but it has to be in a very specific way because you need, you need a weight uh, in order to effectively learn something helpful for, for this domain. And this, this is going to make a very good contrast with our last domain, which is the, the witness uh, puzzle. So for, for this puzzle, all the, the algorithms that learn a policy, they tend to do really well. And so we see a bunch of lines here on the left-hand side, and uh, those are uh, Levin tree search, PHS star, PHS uh, with, a, with a heuristic function without the probability to go. So they very quickly learn a very strong policy, and they're able to solve all instances that we have. Even PUCT that struggles so much in the other domains is doing fairly well here. And that's very likely that's due to the policy that PUCT learns. So uh, if you played uh, this, this game, uh, it's uh, the puzzle that we used is the puzzle that we have to split bullets of different colors. And uh, it's fairly easy to learn a policy here. Like the, the local decisions, should it go left or right? It's very easy to learn, but uh, it's hard to learn the distance to go. So uh, these two here, these two domains, they contrast really well because of this. So here it's uh, somewhat easier to learn uh, the, the cost to go, the heuristic function. And here it's easier to learn a probability distribution. So if your method is able to learn both, then you, you might, might be more robust that way because you're trying to learn uh, both the cost to go and the probability distribution. And in this case here was really helpful, especially for uh, PHS star that learns a strong policy in both cases. So I have more, uh, more results, but maybe they're not as interesting as the questions. So I'm gonna go back to the questions and answer some of the questions and uh, feel free to ask more questions. I have one minute left. So uh, Matt Taylor is asking a question about when is the best time to use each of these algorithms? Does one dominate the others? So I would say always go for PHS star based on the experience that we have because you're trying to learn these two functions at the same time. And the way that Levin G Search does, uh, deals with the, the nodes, uh, it's more effective than PUCT the structure that PUCT uses, it's actually fairly slow because you have to go up and down the tree all the time. So using a priority queue actually makes, uh, makes uh, things really efficient. So I would always go with PHS star uh, based on the results that we've seen so far. Uh, Charfi is asking for N star, why do we take the power uh, D plus uh, H of N. So that's probably referring to this equation here. Let me go back. Uh, this one right here. So this uh, we take this power because we're multiplying this uh, probability. Remember, this is the average probability for the first part of the tree. So if we multiply this D plus H times, we're uh, approximating the probability of doing D plus H steps along this tree. So that's why we have the exponent here to be uh, d plus h. Uh, Nathan, I believe I answered your question about consistency. Uh, I, I, I think I did. Thanks, Rob. You're absolutely right. This is the geometric average of the probabilities. So uh, geometric. Uh, geometric. Thank you. Folks, any more questions? All right, wonderful. Uh, uh, Niraj, maybe I'll, I'll hand it back to you then. Or did, did I miss any of the questions that we have here in the in the chat? Oh, sorry. I, no, uh, I think you covered. OK, excellent. Questions. If anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. Hey, Levi, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, Harsham, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm coming from a reinforcement learning background and sort of the natural thing we do with policies is to like sample trajectories from them. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if I don't want to do like, a, so this is a nice deterministic algorithm, but it seems like roughly speaking, if I'm just sampling from a trajectory, 
Then the number of nodes that I have to expand is also D over N over pi over N because like the probability of hitting the uh, the objective node is one over pi and then I have to sample D nodes to get there. Um, so like, do you have any sort of thoughts on this sort of parallel that the same, roughly the same thing shows up in the deterministic version and with a constant factor in the randomized version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, you're absolutely right. The, the tricky part about uh, sampling is that uh, if you don't know how long you need to go, then you need to decide when to stop. And, and um, so in the first paper that I mentioned in this talk, we also analyzed this. So you could use uh, Luby search like a sequence of numbers so that you can go deeper and uh, shallower and deeper and shallower. And we also analyze those cases too. So we compare uh, the sampling based approach with the systematic deterministic approach as well. So if uh, your tree is bounded, then just sample. Sample until you get to the end. That's a, a really good approach. If it's unbounded and you have no idea how long you need to sample, then you could either use labing tree search uh, because you're going to go uh, uh, very carefully with uh, all directions in this space, or you could use the sampling approach that uses Luby search. So Luby search will tell you how, how deep you need to go with each one of your samples. And if you're interested in the analysis, uh, that's in, in the 2018 paper uh, that I mentioned in this talk. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions, uh, folks? OK, right. so uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to today's presentation. Uh, Levi, thank you so much for <laughs> giving this wonderful presentation today. Uh, if you have still questions or you want to communicate uh, with uh, Levi, feel free to get in touch with uh, on email with him. Uh, I'm sure he would love to listen to the queries and get connected. Uh, and we will see you next week for, yeah. So Levi, thank you for that. He has put his uh, email ID in the chat box. So please feel free to copy that and use it if you want to connect with him. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Levi, for today's presentation. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for showing up. And thanks for the wonderful questions. Uh, everybody, I uh, wish everybody a wonderful weekend. Yeah, thanks.